Good afternoon. Thank you for joining the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute for today's Small Business Hangout. I'm Eric Padmore, Scientific Program Analyst at the NHLBI, and I will be hosting today's session on adoption of new technologies in the clinical environment. In a moment, I'll introduce our moderator and our other panelists, but first, a little bit about our office, uh, which we abbreviate as OTAC. We coordinate the small business innovation research and small business technology transfer programs for the NHLBI. Our team includes a regulatory and business development experts, as well as entrepreneurs in residence, investors in residence, and others to support our small business awardees. We also support those academic innovators taking part in our signature programs, the Centers for Accelerated Innovations, and the research, evaluation, and commercialization hubs. These are translational programs that support the early stages of transitioning technology out of university labs and onto the market. As part of our support, we host these small business hangouts and also do a number of in-person outreach activities. The small business hangouts are an educational series intended to provide biomedical innovators with information to help you succeed in bringing your technology to market. The information conveyed is not product specific and should not be taken as a complete approach for any specific technology. The series covers many different topics, including regulatory matters re relevant to different technology types, understanding the market and customers for a product, developing and defending intellectual property, and issues related to getting coverage for a new technology. All Hangouts are recorded, captioned, and posted to the NHLBI YouTube channel in a single playlist. As a disclaimer, um, please understand that we present these Hangouts for educational purposes, and they are not meant to be guidance for a particular project or technology. Also, the information provided is current as far as we can keep it so for a particular event, but it is always possible for policies and regulations to change in the future. If you are developing something that is within the scope of the NHLBI mission, please contact us for additional guidance. If you are working outside the scope of the cardiovascular and pulmonary uh, sphere, we encourage you to reach out to a program officer at the appropriate institute to discuss the specifics of your project. You can learn more about who to contact at the NIH SBIR website. Some small housekeeping items before we get started. Um, if you are having trouble with the video, uh, try leaving and rejoining the event. There are multiple ways you can listen to the audio portion of today's event, either directly from your computer, uh, you can call the event using the call me icon on your screen, or you can call in using the telephone and event number found in your registration confirmation email. The phone number and access code are listed at the bottom of this slide. Please be sure to select the telephone option on the control panel so you don't get feedback between your computer and your phone. There is also closed captioning at the link identified at the bottom of the screen. To submit your questions at any time during the question and answer panel, um, please understand that you can submit those questions and they will only be visible to the folks here at the NHLBI. Other audience members will not be able to see them. In the event that we get multiple similar questions, we will address them with a single answer, so please be aware that you may not hear your exact phrasing when the question is asked and answered. You can type in questions at any point during the event. We will stop periodically to answer them. Due to the general nature of this presentation, questions specific to a single technology will not be addressed. This webinar is being recorded, and the recording will be posted to YouTube along with our other small biz hangouts. Slides will be provided on request um, at a link you will see at the end of this program. Now to begin today's Small Biz Hangout, adopting new technologies a system perspective, we are joined by three guests from MedStar Health. 
Our moderator today will be Dr. Neil Weisman, Weisman, who is president of the MedStar Health Research Institute. An expert in cardiac ultrasound, Dr. Weisman frequently serves as an expert on FDA and NIH panels and commissions. He has published in the New England Journal of Medicine, Journal of the American Medical Association, Circulation, and the Journal of the American College of Cardiology, amongst others. In addition, he has written a textbook on cardiac imaging. Dr. Weissman has held leadership positions in several national organizations, including chair of the Imaging Council of the American College of Cardiology, and was elected by his peers as president of the American Society of Echocardiography for the 2014-2015 term. Dr. Ron Waxman, an interventional cardiologist, is the director of the Cardiovascular Research and Advanced Education at the MedStar Heart Institute. In addition, Dr. Waxman serves as clinical professor of medicine and cardiology at Georgetown University. He is editor-in-chief of Cardiovascular Revascularization Medicine and on the editorial boards of a number of other publications, including the European Heart Journal and Journal of Interventional Cardiology. Dr. Waxman publishes extensively and has authored or co-authored more than 600 articles. Dr. Waxman has been the principal investigator for more than 100 research trials. And finally, Denise Knoll is director in MedStar Health's Corporate Managed Care Office, where she and her colleagues support MedStar's hospitals, physicians, and ancillary providers by navigating their relationships with payers. Ms. Knoll has extensive experience in the payer world, having worked for Blue Cross Blue Shield of Maryland, now Care First, for over 20 years prior to joining MedStar Health. In her last position with that organization, she was the director of all managed care programs for their group account business. Prior to that role, she served as the manager of medical policy, a department which she created. Ms. Knoll is a certified professional in healthcare management as well as a certified managed care nurse. At this time, it is my distinct pleasure to welcome Dr. Neil Weissman as moderator event as we begin our program. Neil? Uh, for this. Um, Oh, I guess I was on mute. Thank you very much, Eric. Uh, let me first start by um, thanking you to invite MedStar to provide the panel uh, for this discussion. For those that aren't aware, MedStar Health is the largest health system in the Mid-Atlantic. We are a distributive care delivery network with over 10 hospitals, um, more than 280 points of access, and really provide all aspects of care from wellness and um, minor prompt care um, to um, uh, transplants and, and, and um, um, advanced care. Um, throughout the system, um, since we deliver all aspects of care, uh, we also have a very robust environment to do research, and that's what we're pulling upon here for this discussion. We um, run over 1,000 clinical trials in more than 40 different locations. So although we have 5,000 physicians and over 30,000 associates, embedded in that is the research environment. And it's because of that that we could have the experts that we have today. So we're going to hear from two people uh, within the MedStar system who have never even met each other, but as you can see, the work does connect in, in many different ways. We're going to first hear from Dr. Waxman. You heard his introduction, internationally known interventional cardiologist that's going to really talk about developing and validating medical devices. Um, primarily, he will use the cardiovascular space. Then Denise will come and talk about, okay, now once you have this device, how do you get it paid? And she's going to talk about an example uh, in the oncology space. So with that, I will turn it to Dr. Waxman. Thank you very much, Neil, and thank you for the opportunity to participate in this webinar. Uh, my task is uh, indeed to talk about developing and validating uh, medical devices, and I'll share uh, that with you with potentially my perspective with regards to the activities that we're doing here at MedStar. So the question first is, how do you start? And I think one of the things that you need to determine uh, whether the device that you uh, have in mind 
would require an FDA approval before it goes to market. In order to address these, you usually need to know what class device is your device. And that is being actually determined and published in the FDA documentation, which are placed on the slide. Uh, and you can go to this URL and find uh, the type of the device that you are uh, designing or would like to go into the market. Uh, there is a preview of FDA classification panel, and I'll give you some example of how you determine which class your device is. So, for example, if you have a new blood pressure calculator, it is probably going to be considered as a class 2, which is a performance standard. If we can move to the next slide, uh, we'll see a different example, which is a new TAVR device, so mitral or uh, any valve that you want to do, or that's including also stands, and that is uh, considered to be a class three device, which will require the PMA, much more extensive uh, application that you have to submit to the FDA, also with respect to studies, and preclinical and the type of the study design that you'll have to provide in order to uh, get approval for such a device. And then uh, the next example is, again, a telehealth uh, EKG uh, example that, again, considered to be a class two performance uh, standard device. Some of those devices that does not require a PMA, uh, not the class three, the class two devices, are a, can go th approval through a 510K process, which requires sometimes studies, but they're not as extensive or comprehensive as the one with the class three device. So again, uh, just to reiterate these uh, two slides of introduction, uh, you really need to understand where is your device seat and what type of an approval, uh, if you need an approval for the device. Next slide will talk a little bit about uh, what do you need to do when you design your regulatory submission, assuming that your device will require uh, regulatory evaluation. I think the first thing when you're coming with any device, you have to think what is the indication for use uh, the device is going to be intended to, and to determine the most effective trial or study design to evaluate the intended use should review what has been done before and acceptable to FDA or other regulatory bodies. Uh, most of the time you'll find some uh, precedents for similar devices, and that would uh, give you uh, some clue what category you should apply for and how to negotiate with FDA if you need to uh, get to a meeting prior to your submissions. Uh, when you design a study, you also need to look at your endpoints and if this is going to be a device that will be used by patients, you have to determine what patient or subject cohort would be adequate to test your device. But uh, let's maybe step back for a second. Before we go to patients, we do have to get uh, validation on all the data that you have accumulated so far before you receive your SBIR grant and ask yourself, do you need any further bench testing data? Again, uh, many of the devices or the class of devices, uh, you will find at the FDA documentation what are the guidelines for such devices uh, with respect to bench testing and animal testing, etc. cetera. Uh, for example, if you're looking on stands, if you're looking on valves, if you're looking on balloons, uh, there are some precedent and documents, kind of a guideline documents that published by the agency that helps you to determine what should be the pathway in terms of the studies that you have to perform, whether these are bench testing or preclinical. Then you have to think about validation testing of your hypothesis or devices. So let's assume that you do have already some data or concepts, specifically when this is related to software, uh, you have to validate that software. And that requires, again, a um, series of studies uh, that would enable you to move to the next step. 
And then again, many of uh, those uh, devices, when we intend to use it, they are only on a proof of concept of uh, stage, and you need to move beyond it. Again, the validation that this proof of concept indeed going to meet the expectation is important. Then you have to ask yourself, do you need animal testing data? Uh, not all devices need to go through that process, and not all devices uh, we would learn from animal data because, again, uh, there are some limitations with the animal data, uh, and not every device would be applicable to uh, or would be supported by animal data. So, but it's a question that you need to know or to ask yourself, should you need an animal data, you need to know what kind of model you need to use, small animal, large animal, uh, et cetera, and uh, how long is the data needs to be collected. Is that you need an outcome, uh, if this is, is it requires 30 days follow-up, six months follow-up, few years follow-up on the animal, all these, it depends on the type of the device that you have in mind. Next slide. We'll uh, talk a little about uh, to design uh, your project plan for your regulatory submission. So one thing that you need to do is kind of plan out the timing and the sequence of testing that is needed. You'd like to have a nice timeline with projection. That's also going to help you to present it to potential investors that would uh, join you through this process. And many of those uh, investors looking on timeline, uh, what is your timeline to get the device into the market? Uh, so the planning of the timing of the investigational, whether it's bench, preclinical, clinical, is important when you can tell that your approach, for example, is going to be ready based on this planning to market within two, three, four, five years, etc. You have to review a certain task that can be run simultaneously. Some of the stuff, you don't have to wait until you are done. You can do multiple things at the same time. Uh, often, even uh, when we go to the clinical, uh, we are still can continue to do some of the bench testing, uh, whether it's fatigue testing for stamping or whether are those devices that, that are combination devices they do have also some drugs on top of them. You can finish some of the PKPD toxicity, uh, more sophisticated uh, questions that are going to be asked by agency uh, as you're starting your clinical uh, plan. So it doesn't have to be uh, all sequential. It could be also simultaneously, and that's something uh, that you should be planned. Uh, the clinical trial, obviously, if you need to conduct one, uh, it is very important because you want to do it once, you want to do it right, you want to, de to be powered, and you also have to buy the agency to the study. Now, usually if the device has no safety issues, the agency will tell you, will let you go with the study design that you're proposing. But what you need to know whether this study design and the power and the question, when you reach to the end point, is that going to be good enough to grant you an approval? And this is more maybe applicable to type 3 devices, uh, but you have to take this uh, in consultation with FDA uh, because many of those uh, uh, more uh, sophisticated or that class three devices may have to go also to circulatory panel, and uh, which is supposed to be more objective way to consult to the FDA whether to approve or not to approve the device. And the FDA is a very um, useful in giving you a right advice. Where do you go uh, with your trial design, and how do you get it? And not only showing the safety part, but also the efficacy part. And that would be very important on the long run because it's not enough to receive an FDA approval. You need to get also CMS buy into coverage and payments into that. And in order to do this whole planning, you need to be assisted by consultants. And those consultants can help you to construct your project plan. And you have different consultants on different areas. So uh, my best advice is don't try to do everything by yourself. You may know your device the best 
than anybody else, but you may not know all the steps and the stages uh, that has to be built into to your project plan. And by doing it correctly in the first place, you can save a lot of money and time uh, as you move forward with your project plan. Next one. So uh, obviously we are at MedStar, so we have a lot of experience in taking uh, small companies, startup companies, uh, also some SBIR projects, and I'll just uh, maybe illustrate to you what can we do. So we operate within uh, the MedStar under the Cardiovascular Research Network, it's called MCRN, and we're offering uh, the following services. We do bench testing to a certain degree. We do have a preclinical facilities which we can test large and small animals. We also can help you in grant preparation for your uh, other sources funding. Uh, we do help you to design your clinical trial, uh, the investigation plan, and writing a development debt plan. And also, if you need to submit your IDE or IND, we can sit with you and help you with the regulatory submission. <clears throat> we do have a team that uh, often goes with the sponsor uh, of those uh, devices to the FDA and help you to present and get the information uh, in place from uh, the discussion that you had with the agencies. Uh, once you set up on the program, uh, like any other CRO, we have an academic CRO in our organization which help you to manage your trial with project managers. We can develop the electronic data collection and the case report forms. Uh, and then we have different core labs that uh, enable uh, to uh, assess the performance of the device if needed, whether it's an ANJO, CT, MRI, ECHO, IVOS, NEARS. Uh, these are core labs that we are being specialized in our basically uh, offer their services to companies that are in the cardiovascular arena that develop uh, devices. We do have also a biostatistical support uh, to make sure your sample size and your calculations are um, good enough. And then uh, often we can help you to check and balance your hypotheses by data mining. Uh, of the MedStar's epidemiological databases. Um, if you need some medical writing for the submission or at the later stage for publication, we provide this uh, information as well. And we do have fellows that are spending time with us on research, which we usually, um, if, if you guys are comfortable, uh, they would uh, uh, work with you uh, through the development of the project. So. Um, we have a, a lot of array of uh, uh, services, and as essence, if we are interested in your device, we probably would be very attractive from the financial aspect because uh, we are a nonprofit organization, and we've been doing this for the past 20 years, some of these with devices that we developed by our own investigators and also by colleagues that we worked with. So. I think it's always nice to rely on this experience. Uh, this is a slide that summarizes all uh, what I've said so far with our ACRO organization functions. And again, for the sake of time, I'm not going to go through all of this stuff, but if there are any questions, uh, I'll be happy to uh, go over some specifics uh, for the services that we provide for those who have the SBIR. And finally, maybe you should take this uh, email and phone number. If you have any questions, you're always welcome to uh, contact me and you'll get a nice response. And thank you very much again for the opportunity. Well, uh, thank you very much, Ron. Um, and what we're going to do is we're going to hear both presentations, the next one by Denise, and then we're going to uh, open it up to questions. Again, for those attending, uh, WebEx, you can write in questions uh, at any time, and we will gather them uh, towards the end. So if you could advance to the next slide. Um, so while Dr. Waxman um, told you about the upfront process, going from the idea, testing it preclinical, all the things you should think about as you design your trials to get it to uh, the point of FDA approval, um, as we know, there's uh, things out there that have been approved 
but they don't get um, taken into adoption and implemented because you got to pay for them. And um, that's why at a place like MedStar, we want people um, inventing things and developing things, but we also need to make sure we get paid for it. And we've got people like Denise uh, to help us with that. So Denise is going to speak about the payer process for approval of new technologies and health services. Denise. Thank you, Neil. I appreciate the opportunity to speak with everyone this afternoon and to talk about the payer processes. Next slide. Uh, currently, major payers such as Aetna, the Blue Plan, Cigna, United have well-established processes for evaluating new technology to determine if it is still in the investigative experimental phase or it now come, becomes standard treatment. One of the ways that payers convey this information is on their websites through their clinical policies, medical policy bulletins. And when you look through that, you will see all of the information that they have used to consider whether something should be deemed a standard treatment. Among the things they do are look at peer-reviewed published medical journals, available studies that are relevant, evidence-based consensus statements, expert opinions, guidelines from nationally recognized healthcare organizations. Medicare has its own unique process. They have a national coverage determination process, which is detailed on the CMS website, where one can apply to have a national coverage decision made on a given technology. They also have CTI, which is their Council for Technology and Innovation. And this promotes the exchange of information on new technologies between CMS and their other entities that make similar decisions. Moving on to Medicaid, in all honesty, it's not real clear to me whether Medicaid may or may not have a process, and certainly that can differ state to state since Medicaid is handled at the state level. But I suspect that for the most part, they follow Medicare procedures. With Medicaid managed care organizations, they may or may not have a process, but I can say that those MCOs such as Amerigroup, which has been acquired by Anthem, and also United Community Plan, which of course is owned by United, that they generally follow the positions adopted by their parent companies. Next slide. I'm going to talk about the blues in particular because they have had a very well-developed process for a long time. The Blue Cross and Blue Shield Association has had a technology evaluation center since 1985, and this was pioneered specifically to develop scientific criteria for assessing medical technology through comprehensive reviews of clinical evidence. Once they do their full assessment and reach a determination, they then share those findings with all of the blue plans. Next slide. There are five tech assessment criteria. The first, the technology must have final approval from the appropriate government regulatory bodies. For example, with a drug, it has to have full FDA approval or it won't be considered. Second, the scientific evidence has to permit conclusions about the effect of the technology on health uh, outcomes. And this means there should be evidence that consists of well-designed and well-conducted investigations that have been published in peer-reviewed journals, as well as other information. Third, the technology must improve the net health outcome. And basically, it means that the beneficial effects on health outcomes should outweigh any harmful effects. Next slide. The fourth one, the technology must be as beneficial as any established alternatives. And again, it should improve the net health outcome as much as or more than the established treatments. 
And finally, the improvement must be attainable outside the investigative setting, which means when used under usual conditions of medical practice, it can meet the tech criteria three and four. Next slide. Um, overall, the types of evidence that are considered are efficacy trials, effectiveness trials, and observational studies. With the efficacy trials, they will be looking at the homogeneous populations studied, the size of the sample, the duration, the outcomes focus, and the focus on a limited number of intended or unintended effects. For the effectiveness, they're going to be looking for the applicability to patients, low risk of bias in the study, comparison with other interventions, and the complexity of the interventions in practice, and very importantly, all the intended and unintended effects. And the last are just the observational studies. Next slide. I'm going to talk about our experience with CARE First, and I just briefly wanted to show you what a medical policy looks like online. This is from Care First Medical Policy Manual. It happens to be on stereotactic radio surgery. And you'll see the policy um, has a description and a number, and you can find their policies through an alphabetic um, listing of the policies or by subject matter. For example, is it imaging, is it drugs, or what have you. Next slide. This just shows, this, it's the same policy, but showing you the specific policy decision, in this case on radio surgery, in terms of which indications clinically are considered to be standard and accepted, and which are still considered investigational experimental. Next slide. And then at the end of the policy, you will find listed all of the resources that were utilized by the plan in considering the subject matter. Next slide. We're going to talk about our experience here at MedStar regarding the use of CyberKnife, CyberKnife, excuse me, for prostate cancer. And this goes back to 2014, because at that time, prostate cancer was still considered investigative experimental by Care First as a clinical indication for CyberKnife. Next slide. Briefly, for those who may not be familiar with CyberKnife, it is one of the most advanced and effective radiosurgery technologies. And it can control or destroy tumors by aiming radiation beams from more than 1,400 angles. And they're robotically directed, so they're very precise, focusing only on the tumor requires far less number of treatments than are required for conventional radiation therapy, and the treatment accuracy is absolutely unrivaled um, because of its ability to be able to focus on the tumor and conserve the healthy surrounding tissue. Next slide. MedStar Georgetown University Hospital was the first East Coast center to adopt CyberKnife, and it remains one of the most experienced users in the world. And our radiation oncologists at Georgetown had been treating patients successfully for years, of course, with CyberKnife, but also prostate cancer. So they had a wealth of experience. Next slide. Our approach was to start by reviewing Care First current medical policy, all of its references. We determined what other sources of clinical data supporting efficacy and effectiveness of treatment might be available. We determined what the coverage position of Medicare and other commercial payers were, because sometimes it is just helpful to present to a payer that for example, every other major payer in the universe is covering this service. Uh, therefore, this is why we are coming to you to ask for coverage. 
We developed an argument that addressed the reasons the service had not been deemed coverable, and we sought an opportunity to actually meet with the payer and to present. Next slide. We worked very closely with our radiation oncologists to develop a compelling presentation for Care First. And I have to say that our radiation oncologists are, are very passionate about what they do, and particularly the successes that they had achieved using CyberKnife for prostate cancer patients. We developed our presentation, and then we met with Care First Technology Assessment Committee in July of 2014, and one of our radiation oncologists who is an expert in the field of CyberKnife, but also particularly CyberKnife for prostate cancer, delivered the presentation. And the outcome was that Care First approved coverage for CyberKnife just a few months later in the year. Next slide. Why we believe our approach worked is that we tried to cover all the bases. We culled critical data from literature, particularly items that had not been included in Care First references that already had been reviewed. And it was presented in a user-friendly format, so it didn't take a lot of effort for the payer to be able to see what the key points were. Another key success factor for us was the fact that the information was presented by an expert in the field. He was able to answer all of the questions that were given to him very concisely, very effectively, and I think that also made a difference. There was a lot of focus that we provided on the outcomes that had been achieved, looking at it from a safety and efficacy standpoint. There was discussion about the cost of services and that the difference in cost between CyberKnife and traditional radiation therapy and other methods of treatment, there wasn't as huge a disparity as the payer may have thought. And finally, we made sure we addressed the tech criteria, particularly those two to five, which talk about permitting conclusions concerning the effect of the technology, improvement in net health outcomes, beneficial as other alternatives, and attainable outside the investigational setting. Next slide. This is hot off the presses. On December 2nd, Blue Cross and Blue Shield Association issued a press release about a new platform called Evidence Street. And this platform provides healthcare decision makers with access to impartial medical evidence reviews for devices, diagnostics, and pharmaceuticals. It also is a tool that can be used by healthcare product manufacturers to monitor what BCBSA is reviewing and provide them with the opportunity to submit any peer-reviewed evidence that they may have for BCBSA's consideration. And then anyone who does submit evidence will receive a customized report back regarding any relevant gaps in the findings. Um, this is important, I think, because it's very timely information, and they also perform about 460 reviews per year. Next slide. This is just a listing of some suggested resources that you might find helpful about technology assessment. You can also find a lot of helpful information by going directly to payers' websites, looking at their medical policies, but I just put this out there for your consideration. And thank you again for the opportunity to present to you today.
Great. Thank you, Denise. Uh, great presentations, uh, both of you. So uh, appreciate that. Well, the, the questions are rolling in, so we're going to jump into it. Um, Ron, um, I'm going to come back to you first. Um, so um, back, uh, what is it, almost 20 years ago when you and I started working together, um, uh, when I first met you, you were in the midst of being a pioneer in intracoronary uh, radiation therapy, brachytherapy. And um, you um, did a lot of things over the years to bring it from uh, preclinical um, up to uh, an approved commercially available device. Uh, lessons learned. Uh, so when you look back at that, so on the on the web, we've got a lot of startup companies, a lot of new technologies. Uh, what advice do you have from them? So maybe you even think about what did you learn? What was a critical step in that preclinical to clinical investigation? What was a critical step taking it from clinical investigation to commercially available? Yeah, thank you, Neil. So I think uh, there are maybe two crucial questions. Uh, that led me to develop the passion around this invention because uh, the fact that you're an inventor it doesn't mean that uh, this is going to fly forward and you need to get some uh, checks and balances that uh, there is a reason to be a believer because it's not enough that you would believe it this the community around you has to believe so the first thing is the unmet need. Uh, I think when we came with the idea of uh, vascular brachytherapy w was uh, an unmet need. We didn't know how to treat restenosis. And it was something that we were um, frustrated with so many therapies and seeing patients coming again and again. So whatever is the device or the drug or the invention, uh, it has to address an unmet need. I think that would be uh, the best that you can. The second tier, if it's not an unmet need, it could be a me to device, but make it a little bit uh, simpler, um, maybe less expensive, uh, but that's not the same as an unmet need. You have to define that there is something there in your device which is an unmet need. The second component, which for me was very important, uh, was to get a proof on a preclinical model that this technology indeed will work. Because especially when you are in a situation when you had a lot of attempts to solve the solution and you have many, many, many um, attempts before with different directions, uh, you becoming more skeptical, is that really going to work or this is just a, a good theoretical concept. So a simple preclinical model that you can validate your finding by at least two separate tests that done independently give you assurances that this probably will fly forward. So these were the two main drives that took me forward. Uh, and increase the because this, this was not the first time that I looked into this question. Now, after that, I think it was really to find a partner that would help to develop the actual device. In my case, it was not SBIR; it was a small startup company. Uh, you need to have partner with engineer one or two that will help you to take your blueprint uh, into a device that you can utilize. And from that on, um, it's more or less what I laid out. Uh, you have to have a project plan, uh, what's preclinical you need, what clinical you need, when do you start to introduce this to the agency. My best advice is if you're thinking about a device that would need an approval, engage with the agency as quickly as you can. Many of you think that uh, because if you're not living in Washington, it's very hard to get, but a phone call, a face-to-face -face meeting, uh, you're going to get about an hour, but that's enough to get you a, enough information if you're on the right track or in the wrong track and save you time and money. Great. Thank you. 
Uh, um, I'm going to bridge, and one of the questions here is a very nice bridge between your two presentations. Um, and the question is, are technologies that are tested um, at MedStar, um, such as the things that um, uh, Dr. Waxman was talking about, vascular brachytherapy, or the example that um, Denise gave, uh, the CyberKnife, are they given preference for adoption consideration? Um, and I'll start with you, Denise. Um, you know, do you find it, um, uh, do they rise to the top of the pile of things that you're looking at getting uh, um, uh, reimbursement from, or are they easier in some way? Basically, the way things come to our attention to address with the payers in this category is usually when our providers will bring it to our attention. They know that they are not getting paid for given services and the denial reason is that it's not covered because it's considered investigational, experimental, and they would then contact us to find out what can we do to influence change in this policy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, because uh, uh, I, I almost wanted to jump in and start answering the question too, uh, but you answered the same way. If, if something works, if a drug, device, delivery system works, um, the clinicians, the providers, are going to be all over it and they're going to want it. It's, it's, they're going to want to uh, adopt it into their clinical practice and that's when they get to you. So I think by having clinical champions within the system, helps make it a priority, and that's and we're, we all do it for the patients, so uh, I'm with you. Denise, uh, there, there are a bunch of questions, People, and I have to admit, even I was surprised at some of the things. First is, oh my God, how many different places do you have to go and, and different criteria? So the, the, the specific question is, for a medical system like MedStar, do you need to meet all of the criteria from all the different payers? <laughs> It doesn't matter whether it's MedStar Health, it's Hopkins, it's, you know, a physician out in the community somewhere who's providing a service. The payers' criteria are, are established, they are there, and they do have to be met. Now, where there may be, may be variance is in what a given payer considers a sufficient body of evidence in the literature and number of studies, et cetera, proving the safety and efficacy of the, the treatment drug or device. Mm -hmm. But for the most part, one has to meet the criteria in order to gain coverage. And then um, where do, which, which payer do you start with? So one of the questions is, how do you choose the first payer to try to convince to cover your technology? Or should it be doing this uh, for all the payers at the same time? Well, I think a lot is going to depend on if the developer is in a particular geographic area and you look at who are the major payers in that area. Uh, certainly blue plans being national, it is often helpful, we find, to start with care first for us in the Maryland, D.C. region. But the, the others are equally important. The five important ones from our perspective are the ones I named, Aetna, Cigna, United, and Blue Plans. And, and you work on them simultaneously or sequentially? Usually, I would say it's sequentially. We have thing, tentacles going out at the same time. But interestingly, we often find that there are variances between payers and we may only have to address one payer because the others have already determined they're going to cover the particular service. Uh-huh, uh-huh. So, um, one of the things I was surprised in your presentation, Denise, um, uh, was how many criteria there was beyond FDA approval. So as a, as a clinical trialist, I think of FDA approval as the end game, so to speak, you know what I mean? Uh, but a lot right. of these, the blues, check assessment, you know, uh, so uh, is, do you have any examples where you got FDA approval but not reimbursement? Again, lessons learned um, from um, times that it doesn't work out. Well, at least I can say, 
I'm, I'm 99% certain in the case of drugs that require FDA approval, that usually is the turning point for coverage, as long as the drug is being used for the indications for which it was approved. Mm -hmm. With with other devices or other regulatory agencies that provide approval, um, it's it's still going to be up to the payer to determine whether from their perspective, that service or product has truly reached beyond the investigative experimental phase. So, uh, for both of you then, um, and again, Ron, um, I'd be interested if you know of any devices FDA approved but not uh, reimbursed, not uh, commercial uh, payers are not willing to pay. I'll, I'll ask you a specific question that's so untyped here. It seems like you need a lot more clinical trials for getting payer and CMS coverage than you do for the FDA approval. What do you suggest companies work on first, FDA clearance or payer coverage needs? Yeah, so that's a very good question. I think that uh, you probably should engage as well with CMS uh, up front. Uh, I'll give you one example for where we do have FDA approval and we don't have uh, CMS approval, it's carotid stenting. So again, by the labeling, uh, we have much more broader labeling and approval by FDA based on trials, but the CMS is very, very limited in terms of the reimbursement, and that's impact the entire utilization of an approved device, but not approved pay by CMS. Now, most of the payers would look what CMS is doing Therefore, it is important actually to get the CMS buy into your device. Now, the CMS thumb of rule is a rule of thumb is um, if it works, it's fine. But the question is, it necessary? So it's more uh, tuning up to not that this is just effective, but is it really necessary? Uh, because you have to realize that the government not going to increase the budget; they're just going to take maybe from one item reimbursed move to the new device, and that's going to be some shifting of the pays uh, from one device to another. So uh, what usually important to have in the studies is to have the efficacy beyond shadow of a doubt, uh, because you have all kind of levels of efficacy. So if a stand, for example, was approved because it was non inferior to another stand, uh, that may be not sufficient to get a premium on that new stand, even if it's a new one, because there is not enough data mm -hmm. to support that margin. So I think that uh, in my experience, uh, from what I've seen in the device industry, uh, you have to engage early on with CMS. Sometimes you have to build it into the study. And again, mm -hmm. we're talking about more phase three studies, sometimes phase two that you build the economic um, structure into the study design, and that helps you to come with the economic arguments to get reimbursement up front. Uh, thanks, that, that's helpful. Um, so, um, Denise, there's a couple, there's a little confusion about CyberKnife, the example you used, and uh, MedStar getting Blue Cross Blue Shield to cover it. Um, one is direct. Uh, I'm not clear why MedStar was seeking reimbursement from CyberKnife. Doesn't the company do that, the company that's developing the technology? Um, so that, that's one question. Let me just grab the other one here. Uh, Denise, uh, did the CyberKnife company pay MedStar to go get Blue Cross Blue Shield coverage, or was this something MedStar did on its own to get coverage? In other words, whose responsibility is it to, to, to do this? I should have been perhaps more clear in my presentation. What we were going after was not getting approval for CyberKnife in general. That had already, that technology had already been reviewed and approved for given clinical indications. What we were going after was to have the clinical indication of prostate cancer considered no longer investigative experimental. So, so it, it wasn't 
Yeah, why MedStar and why not CyberKnife to do that? To be honest with you, I'm not completely certain the extent to which the the developers and the manufacturers of these devices lobby for approval. I suspect it's pretty substantially. But I think when one talks about the expanded indications that it is sometimes most helpful that the physicians in the field who have the expertise using the particular services be the ones that lobby for the coverage. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. Um, so let's go um, to, um, this is a, for either of you, do companies have the opportunity to meet with medical directors for the new technology assessment teams at payers to determine what clinical evidence the payers need to approve coverage? Um, let me try that again. Do companies have the opportunity to meet with medical directors or the new technology assessment teams at payers to determine what evidence the payers need to approve coverage? I'm not sure I fully understand that question. Do either of you uh, want to give it a try? I, I believe I understand it, yes. Um, anybody can certainly contact a payer and inquire about what their expectations are in terms of the information to be presented for them to consider whether a service can be evaluated for, for coverage. A lot of this information is right out there on their websites. It also isn't necessary that one talk with the medical director. There often are people in the medical policy or medical technology areas of payers that can, in a phone call, just ad address with you what information they need. But I think a lot you can just find on the actual websites. Mm -hmm. uh, Denise, a very technical question about, uh, please note Blue Cross Blue Shield evidence that requires a subscription in order to log in. Do you have to be a hospital or medical system to get access? Do you know the answer to that? I don't think you do. I logged in the other day, and as far as I'm aware, it's a subscription that it doesn't cost anything, and I believe anyone can log in. It may ask you what kind of entity you are. I'm, off the top of my head, I can't remember. So re we're down to the last few minutes. Randomized uh, reimbursement consultants have long been saying it takes five randomized clinical trials to get coverage from, uh, from Blue Cross Blue Shield. Do you think this is true? No, it's not true. It depends on the studies, and if you do the study one time correctly, you're going to get reimbursement, at least on the device industry. We had one randomized study with the drug eluting stent. Coverage was immediately, even before FDA was approved, it was like uh, unprecedented. TAVAR was one randomized study, I've got approval. So I, I don't think that's true to get five. You have to do it one time correctly, and you have to build some economics into the study, and that can be done, again, in consultation with CMS upfront. I, I, believe that CMS is a very good um, way to start with because most of the pairs will follow what CMS does and most of, again, it depends what device you use, you, you're targeting your population. Uh, but I think that is not requiring five studies. Okay, last question. I need a short one-minute answer. Any predictions about what might change at the FDA with the new law passed this week regarding expedited reviews for breakthrough technology devices? Who's got a crystal ball? I believe it's going to be faster to get approval. I'm not sure it's going to be faster to get paid. <laughs> All right. Um, Eric, I think I'm going to, I think we got through them. There was a question about are the slides going to be available? I'll let you address that. Uh, Eric, I'll turn it back to you if that's okay. Maybe not. You might be on mute. All right, 
And I'm going to, while Eric's getting off oh. mute, I'm going to read the book. Oh, He's, now we can hear you. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, we're having a little technical problem there. Um, well, thank you, Neil, and thank you, Dr. Waxman, and thank you, Denise, uh, our guest today from MedStar, for a very informative uh, program with a lot of good uh, dialogue there towards the end, um, and even some crystal ball predictions, which are always nice. Um, as far as uh, the slides, again, I think you saw we had um, the links uh, to request. We have a link to request the slides, and you can also stay connected with the NHLBI Small Business Program um, through the various social media and, I guess, traditional media connections that you see there, including telephone, email, um, on the web at nhlbi.nih.gov slash SBIR, as well as uh, Twitter. Um, so again, thank you to our panelists. Um, thank you to our panelists for uh, the program today. And again, this presentation will be archived on our YouTube uh, channel. Um, it'll take a couple of days uh, for that to be mounted. And you can contact uh, any of us at any time here at the NHLBI uh, for further information. Thank you and good afternoon.